At the end of 2022, we packed up and left for a 12 month lap around Australia. We had planned this for over four years leading up to that point and choosing some sort of trailer to follow behind our Land Cruiser 200 series was a big part of that planning. Now, of course, we chose the Lifestyle Recon R4T SE Hybrid Camper Trailer. months following, we dragged this trailer through some of the roughest, toughest and remote terrain that our country has to offer. From the WA South Coast, across the Nullarbor, on remote limestone tracks of South Australia, the Flinders Ranges, the roads of Tasmania and the mud of the Victorian high country, the windy tracks of the Snowy River and the canopies of the Blue Mountains, the tarmac of Mount Panorama and the beaches of Tiwa, the barges of Inskeep Point and of course Fraser Island. Our back Queensland roads to open starry skies, the greenery of the Daintree and the red dust of Cape York, the endless dusty corrugated roads in the Northern Territory and the rugged rocks in the Kimberley and down to the red centre. Heritage trails to Adelaide and back across the Nullarbor. In this time, we have ticked off some iconic tracks including the PDR and the Battle Camp Road in Cape York, the Savannah Way, the Gib River Road, the Tanami Road, the Old Garn Heritage Trail and the Unandatta Track to name a few. We have not gone easy on this lifestyle in its 12 month shakedown, only receiving the camper three days before we packed up and left for our big lap. Now we're spending over 350 nights in this unit with my family of four. We have come to learn all of the tips, the tricks, and of course the limitations of this trailer. In this episode, I'm gonna talk about some of the features that we have absolutely loved and used all of the time. Some of my recommendations for optional extras worth adding, what we've modified on our Recon R4, and of course what hasn't worked or what's failed. At the end, I'm gonna offer my opinion as to whether or not I would purchase another lifestyle camper trailer again if I had my time over, knowing what I do know now. This camper trailer has covered almost 50,000 kilometers in that short 12 months. And I'm gonna try and cover a lot of information in today's episode. But if you're looking for a specific piece of information, check out the timeline below or the chapters in the description to skip ahead. So let's start with the front end. With a premium camper, we get a premium hitch. And that's of course the class leading Cruise Master DO35. As expected, I've had no issues with the operation or the maintenance side of this. The wiring for the trailer lighting and the 12 volt charging cables are run through each chassis rail and exit out the front here. A guard and heat shrink here not only give this a really nice finish, but protect it from damage. And as such, these have been flawless in the last year. Now this front section of the drawbar here is coated in this rubberized protective coating. And although it has worked quite well, it is just starting to peel right at the front, but it hasn't really continued past that point. An extra included in our build was this drawbar tap. Now, although it's been used a couple of times, given the location of it and the tight fit underneath it for attaching hoses, it really wasn't used enough to justify fitting it again if we had our time over. The Arc Jockey wheel has performed well with routine maintenance over the year and is much, much easier to operate than one of those cheaper single shaft styled wheels. We also optioned an extended drawbar, which means that we get an extra 300 millimeters in this section here. Although we use this area for the storage for the kids' bikes for the majority of the trip, if I had my time over, I probably wouldn't do this. Not only does it add length to your entire combination, but it does slightly reduce your ramp over angle as well. In 2022, when Lifestyle released the new SE models, we also got these hinged gas bottle brackets for the two included 4.5 kilo gas bottles. Previously, this was a fixed bracket and made it a lot harder to access. However, now it's so much easier to remove the bottle for filling or to source another appliance. On the front of the camper, we optioned this padded cover to protect the sheeting underneath. And although it might appear as a cosmetic extra, I would definitely get it again. It really is quite amazing just how much debris is flicked up from the rear of your tow vehicle, even with a stone stomper fitted. So not only does this cover here protect the front of your camper, but it also absorbs some of that impact from anything that may be hitting it and avoids it rebounding at full speed into the back of your vehicle. Now moving down the side of the camper and we have these hatches built by Lifestyle Campers. Now these are built in-house by the company and they are used around the camper. We've got them up the front here for the storage boots. We've got one for the hot water system, the electrical inputs, and of course some storage on the other side as well. And this is one area that we did have a few dramas. The design incorporates a dual seal inside and works really well when I can get compression on it. And the reason I say this is because I've had many issues with these latches. 
So over time, and sometimes a very short time, these latches would start to work loose and fail altogether. They would start to open with a very light press, then they'd start to open by themselves and refuse to lock again. There were even instances that these hatches opened up while we were driving on the highway. And one instance where we actually lost a gear out of one of our storage compartments, which we unfortunately never found again. Now, Lifestyle were very good in issuing new replacements each time this happened, and we've had the entire camper changed three times now. So this third set of locks is working, but it's still early days. Now, while we're on the road, I also bought these cheap chrome ones from Bunnings as backups, and to be honest, they never failed. They just looked a little out of place. The lower storage section doesn't have any lighting in here either, so jump on eBay and grab a couple of these sensor lights that run off AAA batteries to help you out at night. Links will be in the description below. The hot water system also has one of these lifestyle designed hatches that has to be opened every single time you want to use the system. Now, initially I thought I was going to get annoyed having to open and close this every single time we pull up to camp, but saying that now, I'd much rather do this and make sure I have a fully pressurized and dust sealed van, then rock up to a van full of dust after a long day on the road. Underneath the camper the whole way around, we have these optional extra rock sliders. These really do look great and set the camper off really nicely, making it look tough and strong. However, I will admit that we never really needed them on the tracks and driving that we did. Given the extra cost and the weight they add, I probably wouldn't add them again if I had my time over. The next up, we have this massive storage compartment on the off side of the van. And I've been very impressed with how all this gear has held up. Between the latches, the gas struts and the seals, everything has just worked exactly as it's designed to. Now, of course, we have a huge space inside of here. It does take a little bit of time to really maximize the efficiency of how you pack your gear so they can all fit in here and it can be accessed easily. Now, initially I was planning on doing some sort of shelf design to organize the gear, but to be completely honest, that probably would have limited my storage options, not really assisted it. Now, the floor panel has been split in two on these newer models, so getting underneath for more storage or maintenance is relatively easy. But I would love to see some folding legs that can come down and hold these panels up. At the moment, there's nothing here, and it's just either using other gear to balance it or just your head. Something that I could probably quite easily add myself. Now, behind that storage section, we have the outdoor shower. To be completely honest, we actually never use this once on our trip because we have the interior ensuite, but it comes with this model anyway, so it didn't really help us or hinder us by being right there. But just above that, we have the dust suppression system. This is a proprietary design made by Lifestyle Campers, and we use this a lot, and I mean a lot. Now, I was skeptical of the system primarily because of the location here at the back corner and the fact that it pushes most of this air into the sensitive electrical componentry, but we've traversed some very, very dusty tracks on our travels and probably over 10,000 kilometers of unsealed roads, and it never let us down. The newer models come standard with unifilter elements, which to be honest, I really dislike because of the cleaning and re-oiling aspect. However, I ended up buying some more to have five in total and would clean them all together once when they were all dirty. Now, although I don't like the maintenance aspect of an oiled uni filter, I will admit they work very, very well. The rear element almost never had a mark on it, but in really, really dusty conditions, if you're driving for an entire day, they do have to be replaced daily, which is why I now carry five in total. Onto the rear of the camper, and you do get an option for the configuration of this rear wall. And you can see here that we've opted for a single spare tire. And if I had my time over again, I'd do the same. We never needed this, although we had two flats on the camper, they were both repairable by plugs and survived the entirety of the journey like this. Now we did, however, opt for a firewood box on the other side, which we used for a few months, but we later ended up swapping this out for a generator styled storage box. This was far more practical for our scenario and gave us a further lockable and weatherproof storage at the rear of the camper. So moving down to the main side of the camper and we have hatches and storage just like the other side. However, we also have this storage hatch down here that suffered from the same latch issues I spoke about earlier. In fact, this one opened a couple times while we're driving and did slightly dent the face of it, which also slightly impaired some of the dust sealing properties. Now, of course, up here we have our kitchen, which we'll come back to in just a little while, but moving a little bit further forward and we have our drop down picnic table. Now, this came in incredibly handy and is an optional extra, but something I'd highly recommend. Although you might think there's a ton of room inside the kitchen area there, this was down at every single camp and always had something on it. So well worth the money. Now the main access door here is a generic Kamek caravan accessory. And because of this, it doesn't have the same dust sealing qualities as the rest of the camper with components made by Lifestyle themselves. The last exterior component is the awning, and the Fiamma F45S awning has worked very well and much better than expected. Used in conjunction with a center brace and anti-flap kit, it becomes a very solid structure and doesn't move even in some strong winds and heavy rain. 
Given the design of this camper and the fact that it promotes outdoor living, we did also option on the full annex for this awning. So that includes three walls that surround each side of the awning and a draft skirt that goes along the bottom to really seal this outdoor section up. However, when receiving the camper, we realized just how physically big these units were and we decided not to bring the whole lot because of, well, lack of storage. So we only brought the kitchen end wall and the draft skirt on our big lap. Now we used these two numerous times and was incredibly handy in sealing off this corner around the kitchen, particularly in cold, wet and windy conditions. Given how helpful and maybe even vital these walls were in protecting the kitchen area while we're at camp, I'd probably buy the full annex again just to receive those two walls. Now the roof itself lifts via two electric powered actuators, one on each side, assisted by several spring loaded scissor frames. Now initially I was a little skeptical of these because electric actuators means that potentially more things could go wrong and given the design of this particular camper you need that roof to be up to access the bed so mucking around with faulty actuator rods is something that you really don't want to do after a long day on the road. But the good thing is I never had to because I can say that we never had an issue with these whatsoever. We have opened and retracted this roof hundreds and hundreds of times and it's not failed once. I keep it maintained by spraying the actuator rods with a bit of silicon spray from time to time and the scissor lifts with a little adhesive lubricant. The underside of the camper has copped a beating from some of the tracks that we have taken it down. The hardware, the electrical cabling and the plumbing has held up perfectly. We haven't had a single water leak or single torn cable or anything of concern to be honest down here at all. And part of the reason for that, I believe, is the Cruise Master ATX suspension. Now, we did option this camper with the Cruise Master airbag suspension, which has performed flawlessly in the last 12 months. Now, Cruise Master are the industry leaders for suspension systems in caravans and camper trailers on the Australian market. And the design incorporates a good protection for all of those suspension components. You can see here the amount of rock, stone and road debris that has impacted the front edges of the suspension arms, primarily on the front axle. But this hasn't affected the performance or the reliability in the airbags, the shocks or the straps. Even the electrical cables had their own little channel here to protect them from stone impact. In our travels we had one shock mount that came loose and was easily tightened. And we just had to rotate the rear restriction cables to move them away from the airbags, but otherwise they have held up incredibly well. This suspension is an optional extra, however, is by far one of the most used optional extras included in our build. Being able to lift and lower the camper around camp was more helpful than we could ever imagine, and it would be hard to go back to anything else in the future. An optional extra that I'd highly recommend considering. Well, that covers just about all of the external components of the trailer, but before we go jumping on inside, we can talk about this 175 litre Thetford fridge. Now, the fridge has held up fairly well in our travels considering what we've taken it through, but early on we did have a small issue with the condenser fan. It was a simple $30 part that was covered under warranty, but due to lack of knowledge and operational issues within the Thetford organization, it required three visits to a dealer to get fixed, so it wasn't a great experience. Saying that, outside of that, the fridge has performed very, very well, although I will note it is quite power hungry. While we're here as well, we can talk about the lighting both inside and on the exterior of the camper, which has all performed very, very well. Aside from a single interior light that needed replacing because the individual switch stopped working, nothing else has failed. The lighting around the camper is fairly good. However, it would be nice to see Lifestyle just add one more light on the front of the camper, facing it down towards the drawbar. Now, I'm lucky that I had the light from my Land Cruiser's tailgate. However, at night without this, it is very dark when trying to hitch up. So moving up into the camper and we can talk about the air conditioning. Now I know there's many people out there who believe that the air conditioning has no place out in the bush, but as a family of four living in a very confined space, I'd have to strongly disagree. Although it wasn't used a whole lot in our year, when it was used, it came in very, very handy. And the fact that it was wired to our camper's inverter meant that we could use it off grid. So we used it for both cooling and for heating at certain times on our lap. In northern New South Wales, when we're inland, it was down to one degree overnight. And with this PVC not being the best insulating material, it would have been one degree in here as well. So having this running on a low setting overnight only used about 25% of our battery, but kept us very, very comfortable. And the opposite could be said for the top end of Australia. When trying to put the kids to bed, when the sun's still up in the top end, just after having a hot shower, it is very humid and warm in here. Running the air conditioning for 20 to 30 minutes would get the kids to go to sleep nice and easily and nice and quickly. In addition to that, while we're in the Northern Territory, we also got the flu and we were very, very uncomfortable in high 30 degrees inside this camper. So we got the generator out, we ran the aircon during the day and just rested in the only cool space around. 
If you are considering getting an air conditioning for your camper though, I would strongly recommend it getting it built from factory. Although it's possible to fit them after the fact, it is much, much easier to get it built with the camper while it's being built rather than trying to retrofit down the track. Now in the front corner, we also got the ensuite as well. And this comes with what they call a waterfall edge drain design, which means the water comes off the edges and looks really, really great. But I will say that because the water moves slowly off the edge into a single drain area, it does seem to accumulate dirt and debris quite easily. And it's only a matter of time before it clogs up. Now it's not too hard to fix by simply pulling up that raised section of floor and giving it a good clean underneath. But it's something that has to be done every couple of weeks in order to prevent blockages at less than ideal times. Now the SE model comes with a roof mounted Sirocco fan as well, but if there's a few of you in here like there was for us, it would probably pay to add the additional unit from factory like we have. Again, something that is much easier to do while the camper is being built than retrofitting it. Then of course we come to the kitchen, the heart of the camper, the area that the four of us would spend the most time around, and an area of the camper that was used multiple times a day, every single day without fail, and it still looks great. The newly designed roller doors never caused an issue or jammed and there was always plenty of storage space and the lighting was perfect. Now there were just a couple of very minor issues that we had to address in here over the period of our 12 month trip. And the first one were these plastic T-lock receiver carriers. Now they are a 3D printed part and we had this right hand one crack a couple of times. It was very easy to replace under warranty, but what we found was the recess in here was just a little bit too deep. So we spaced it up with a couple of washers reinstalled and we've never had a drama since. We also had the sink rattle loose as well, just breaking away from the adhesive sealant that holds it down. Again, some more sealant in there and we've had no dramas. But the biggest issue we've had in this area is of course the Safari induction cooktop. And I've gone into a lot more detail about that in my long-term review on induction. But essentially we had some hardware failure in here on two occasions and this one here is the third induction cooktop to be installed in this camper. Moving on to our water systems, and we've opted for a total of 320 litres of water on board this R4 camper. And that is separated into 270 litres of general water and a dedicated 50 litre drinking water tank. Completely separated, separate fill points, separate pumps, separate plumbing, and separate outlets on the four sets. And it has to be one of our favourite modifications along with the suspension on this camper. Having the ability to siphon water from any source for our general use, knowing that we still have a 50 litre tank dedicated to good quality drinking water was absolutely awesome. Now the attention to detail in the build also comes through in the plumbing system with all of the connections being sealed or using the appropriate clamps and it pays because we haven't had a single water leak or any issues with our water and plumbing system throughout the 12 months and we've taken this trailer quite some places. And finally, the electrical panel. Now I have spoken about this in previous episodes because it is an absolute beast of a power system. We have 600 amp hour of lithium battery capacity underneath this hatch here. We have a three KVA inverter down the back there and over a kilowatt of solar on the roof, all of which has worked perfectly over the last 12 months. The way the panel presents is a testament to the care taken during assembly. And it's easy to find out what powers what. We picked this camper up with only two 200 amp hour lithium batteries, but because of the amount of power that the induction cooktop takes, along with all the other appliances in this camper, we opted to up that to 600 amp hours by adding in an extra battery. Other than that, this is a factory system and it has performed very, very well. This being said though, I would like to see the electrical system accompanied by a Victron Touch 5 or Touch 7 to easily see and manage the power usage to replace this Cymarine panel just here. This would match the rest of the Victron gear and give much more versatility to the settings and preferences. And the main reason for this is because of the charging profile. If you plug this camper into a 240 volt power source, it will charge this camper at a full 2000 watt until fully charged. Now that's great when you're plugged into shore power, but when you're using a generator, that maxes the generator out. Again, it works, but if you wanna use the aircon, the induction cooktop, a kettle, or any other medium or high powered appliance, it will trip the generator requiring a restart. Having a Victron Touch 5 or Touch 7 in here would not only give you a much easier way to see and access all of the Victron gear in the back panel, but also the ability to choose exactly how much power you have coming in from a 240 volt source, which meant if you wanted to use another appliance, you could tone that down a little and then use the appliance without overloading a generator. It's a small thing, but I think it would make quite a large difference. Overall, this has to be one of the most impressive, one of the most reliable and one of the strongest camper trailers on the Australian market. Now I'm not sponsored by Lifestyle, I paid retail price for this and waited my two years for it to be built just like everybody else to take ownership. 
You'd expect new camper trailers and caravans to perform quite well, but this one here has done almost 50,000 kilometers in some very testing terrain over a prolonged period being used day in and day out every single day. Now, of course, we've had a couple of minor appliance issues and some plastic trims here and there, but structurally, the chassis, the suspension, the tires, the body, the electrical, the plumbing, and everything has just held together and worked so well. Now you hear horror stories out there from people fighting manufacturers of caravans due to all sorts of issues from internal water leaks to structural issues to frame and chassis issues and the lack of regulation in the RV industry in Australia leaves much to desire for the customer. But this camper trailer here is built for the adventurer who just wants to get out and wants something that works and is reliable and I think it definitely ticks that box. Now, if you've seen my channel before, you know that I like to modify things. I like to customize things. I mean, just take a look at my Land Cruiser. It sure doesn't look like it did when it rolled out of the factory almost 10 years ago. But with this recon here, you don't need to do that. And we're a living example of that, only having three days with this thing brand new before leaving for our trip around Australia. The only things that we've modified on this camper since owning it have been putting a third battery in, replacing the firewood box for a generator storage box, putting a stone stomper on the front and a white tie security system. Not that I'd recommend that product. As you can probably see, I can't say it enough and just how genuinely impressed I am with this camper here. They are very expensive, I will admit that. However, after a year using it the way we have, we can see why. Now I hope that this episode here has provided you with a bit of an insight as to what it's like to own a genuinely Australian design and built hybrid camper trailer. And if you're looking for something like this, then I would strongly and highly recommend having a look at the Lifestyle range. It really does offer some of the best turnkey packages out there. But whether or not we see you out on the tracks, we'll see you next time on Exploring Oz. Cheers.